next couple of minutes. That's a joke. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Happy November and happy Veterans Day. Uh, hats off to our veterans who make freedom possible for all of us. And uh, I appreciate how, how many here are veterans? Hey, good crowd, good crowd, good show of hands. I applaud you all. Thank you so much for your, for your work on, on our behalf. On behalf of the Historical Society and our wonderful program committee uh, and event liaison Kathy Beatty, welcome to our box lunch talk for November. Uh, I am Fred Teeter. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Kathy Beatty, our, our curator of collections uh, since 1999. Uh, great colleague. I'm proud to work with her, and she's going to introduce our speaker today. Kathy. That's why they had me come up here. I'm the comic relief. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. I think many of you probably know Mimi. If not personally, you know her from the things that she does. Um, she's been involved with the Carroll County Genealogical Society for many years, and she edits their newsletter, The Carrolltonian. She's been volunteering at our library for, boy, almost 10 years now, I think? 12. 12 years, she says. So she's one of our dedicated library volunteers. You also see her picture twice a month in the Carroll County Times, where she does the column Carol's Yesteryears. Uh, and she is also on our publications committee, where she helps to write and edit the Carroll History Journal. So um, whenever I have a question, I go to Mimi, because she can usually tell me where to find the answers. So she's worked very hard on this. This started out as an issue of the Carroll History Journal. And she just had too much good stuff to get into the print version, so she's here to tell you the full story today. Please welcome Mimi Ashcraft. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, how many of you are either from Union Bridge or are pretty well acquainted with Union Bridge? How about uh, who, who might be an, an employee or a former employee of uh, Lehigh Portland Cement Company? But some of you have relatives who were. Um, well, welcome to all of you. Um, as Kathy mentioned, this was addressed, this subject matter, the, trans the transformation of Union Bridge by the, Le uh, not Lehigh, by Tidewater Portland Cement Company. Um, was, was an article that we published in the Carroll History Journal last year about this time. But I, I did have more material, I've got more slides, and so uh, hopefully in the next 40, 45 minutes we'll be able to offer you some things that are a little bit different than what you read before. So this covers a, approximately 11 years uh, at the beginning of the last century. And that's a picture of the, the beautiful limestone that underlies lots of Union Bridge. I want to thank these people for their help um, putting this together. Nobody, I believe, is here actually today representing Lehigh, but some of them were involved in helping me. Most of you are aware that Union Bridge started out as a very small farming community. By 1877, when this map was made, there were some big changes. And most of them started because the railroad, the Western Maryland Railroad, came to Union Bridge in 1862. And you can see right up here, the car shops where there was a lot of work going on to repair uh, the railroad cars of the Western Maryland Railroad. So from about 1862, um, for quite a long time, those shops were in existence. The arrow down here points to where Tidewater Cement Company was going to establish itself. But you see, by 1877, there was a healthy-looking main street, several churches, several schools, um, and, uh, and it was a very well-established town. 
here by 1904, you can see how elaborate the railroad shops were. Um, a turntable for turning around the cars. Uh, this is Farquhar Street, which will become quite important when the uh, Tidewater Cement Company uh, comes into existence about five years later. But these are the shops where uh, mechanics and painters and upholsterers were working on the, on the railroad cars. Whoops, see Daisy. The height of, of the employment at uh, the Western Maryland Railroad car shops was probably about 1905, and there would have been up to 300 people, uh, 300 men employed. Uh, but by 1910, a lot of the shop work had been sent over to Hagerstown, and so the number of employees was down to maybe between 50 and 100, and employment was rising and falling. It was not very steady. But here you've got some of the fellows working at the car shop. In 1898, Maryland Collegiate Institute was founded, and it was a Church of the Brethren College. Um, on the outskirts, on the southern outskirts of Union Bridge, and some of you may remember exactly where that was, where those buildings were. I've turned this one upside down, this picture right here, to represent the same set of buildings um, with the girls' dorm, the boys' dorm, uh, classrooms, and, and so forth. So this was another bit of the prosperity of Union Bridge. Let's turn just a minute and take a look at the cement industry in the United States. Um, it really got started in 1817 era, era with the construction of the Erie Canal, uh, but that wasn't Portland cement. Portland cement really got started about 1871 with the founding of a company in the Lehigh Valley of, of eastern Pennsylvania. And this slide shows you how the huge increase in production of Portland cement from 1880 to 1900 uh, came about. Reduction in, in the imports uh, made in the United States. And so obviously trying to uh, establish a Portland cement company in Union Bridge was a really good idea. In 1907, um, there was a chemist who came representing a, um, a company, a glass company from Pittsburgh. And he was looking at the limestone in the area around Union Bridge. And then they decided that, in fact, this wasn't appropriate so much for making glass as it was for producing Portland cement. And so they got together some of the outstanding American geologists, cement experts, and they put together a, uh, an investment company called Republic Finance Company that started the whole process going. So a $1,750,000 in bonds were sold. They purchased 200 acres of land. Obviously, the railroad was a big deal. It was so important in trying to bring things into Union Bridge to take the cement away from Union Bridge. So they had to make uh, a good contract with the Western Maryland Railroad. They needed a source of coal, so they uh, knew that was available in West Virginia. And then they needed a right of way to get from the Western Maryland tracks on the uh, north edge of town down to the south end of town where they were going to establish the, uh, the Portland Cement Company. So once they had gotten this started, they formed a new company, Tidewater Portland Cement, and that was the beginning of, of the real process of, of uh, making cement in Union Bridge. Most of the information that I have 
comes from the newspaper, the Union Bridge pilot, um, with the addition of information from the census records. Uh, because, very sadly, there are no records left of the, the people who were involved in Lehigh, I mean, in Tidewater um, in the early days. So here in 1909, between 1907 and 1909, they got uh, everything in place, and no sooner had they paid for the property than they brought 50 men in to start laying the track between the Western Maryland car shop area and where the, uh, the cement plant was going to go up. So there was no grass growing under the feet of all of these men. I hope some of these pictures show up pretty well on the screen. But here you, you see them on Farquhar Street getting ready to, to put the track down uh, between the plant and, or the potential plant and the, the railroad, all hand labor. Uh, pickaxes, shovels, uh, you can see in the background a horse drawn cart. And here's more, uh, another example of pretty much hand labor, hard labor. And there in the background, are the buildings of uh, what was Maryland Collegiate Institute that would later become Blue Ridge College. And here in this very nice, clean, neat looking uh, picture is the opening of the hydrated lime plant, which was the first plant um, of the whole complex of Tidewater Portland cement. Um, so this was open house between basically October, September of 1909 and April of 1910, they put this together, bringing in, you can imagine, the incredible amount of uh, passage of railroad cars uh, up the Maryland track, up Farquhar Street, to bring in all of this equipment. In that building, there were five huge lime furnaces to um, burn the lime to make hydrated lime. Each of these towers was 48 feet, 48 feet high and 11 feet in diameter. Um, and in the front here are the, the bins where the coal was, was stored and the little railroad track where they would bring up the lime to to dump it in the top of, of the furnaces. So you saw the other picture, nice and clean and neat looking. Here we go with the plant in operation. And this was just the beginning. Um, looks looks uh, not too bad, not too bad in those days. And here, early in 1910 was an advertisement from the, the Union Bridge pilot of uh, this fertilizing lime that they were going to be selling. And this was just part, as I said, of the, the whole plant. The Sanborn maps, um, which were insurance maps, give us a good idea of how the um, company changed and increased in size. And so this one from 1910 gives you an idea of how things were getting started. It was still just the hydrated lime plant uh, right here with its five furnaces um, that was in operation, but they were beginning to put in some of the rest of the buildings. And you see this whole complex of tracks, all of which are leading back to the one um, track that goes down Farquhar Street. So you can sort of imagine what it must have been like to have all of those um, cars constantly coming back and forth if you were a resident of Farquhar Street. And it was a residential area um, in the main part of, of Union Bridge. Sam's Creek right down here and They've already, by 1910, established uh, a powerhouse. 
And so, off in this direction would be where uh, Maryland Collegiate Institute or Blue Ridge College would be located. Pardon? It, it was, and I'll, I'll get there, Shirley, thank you. Um, obviously, with all this work, uh, there were plenty of jobs, and they needed them because the railroad uh, was not supplying as many uh, jobs as it had been, the 300 workers that uh, were uh, employed at the height of the, uh, the car shops. So there were skilled workers obviously needed, but what they really needed most because of all this, this um, unskilled work, they needed unskilled workers. And so by as early as the spring of 1910, they were getting immigrants from uh, mostly Eastern and, and Southern Europe who were coming um, to Union Bridge and going to work there. Also, of course, they had local workers and then they had laborers that they brought in by railroad every day um, all the way from Baltimore. By 1911, by the beginning of 1911, they, began, uh, they started um, employing local African Americans. The railroad shops had never employed any local blacks, but uh, Leha, um, <coughs> Tidewater, sorry, um, began to employ local African Americans, and it was a, a great opportunity for them um, to do something other than the typical work that they had been, that had been available to them. What were the lives of these workers like? Well, you can sort of imagine. It was, it was pretty brutal work. Um, and I'll talk mostly about the laborers because I really don't know a whole lot about the um, more skilled workers. So for most of the time, it was six days a week, $1.40 for a 10-hour day of work. Um, housing was really at a premium. Um, the newspaper constantly mentions the fact that there just, nobody in town was getting involved in trying to supply more housing. Um, the company eventually did build a, a fair amount of housing. There were a lot of people who took in borders. They would rent um, some building out behind their house. Um, anything uh, was, was practically available, and a lot of it was described as shacks. I can't remember the year, but uh, the workers did strike once, um, hoping to get the wages increased to $1.60 a day, and the time uh, down to nine hours a day. But because of the abundance of workers, they had no power, and so the company just ignored them and they went back to working for $1.40 a day. There was just a huge turnover of people, particularly among the immigrants. They'd come a week later, they might go. It must have been a nightmare for anybody who was writing paychecks at that particular point in time. You have so many workers with unusual names that you probably couldn't spell, and in many cases, these people couldn't spell either. So life after uh, work was over was uh, a rather uh, interesting time. Um, and this was a time, of course, when there was a mixing of all these various eth various ethnicities, various races involved, and so I wanted to read you a, um, a little quote that came out of the newspaper um, about uh, one particular incident. An attempt to harmonize and amalgamate bad whiskey and several different strains of foreign blood from both males and females on the streets Tuesday evening resulted in the arrest of the participants and fining one of them six dollars in costs. It appears that when the warring factions met on Elgar Street, the offender insisted on fighting it out. Honors were about even at the end of the fracas, 
the wife of one of the men coming to her husband's rescue and with an outburst of true devotion proceeded to reduce a board to kindling wood over the back of the transgressor. So that was life. There, there, was, there was a lot going on, lots of fights. People were hurt, they were um, sent to hospital, um, doctored up uh, at home or whatever. Um, and of course, there was plenty of, of liquor available. It was the days before prohibition. What first really got me interested in this whole topic was looking at a page from the 1920 census. Um, and here it is, and I realize you can't, uh, can't read any of it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about number one and number two. This represents basically one street on the outskirts of town, McKinstry's Road, it was called. Um, and uh, some of the questions that were asked in the, eight, in the 1920 census um, were different than in previous years because of the tremendous amount of immigration in this period of time. Um, they were very interested in recording who was an alien, who was naturalized, what year did they immigrate. Um, place of birth was always asked, what was their mother tongue, do they speak English, can they read and write either in their native language or, or English not only the kind of job they had, but who their employer was. This is not a man that I know, it's just one I found on me using Google. So from that page in the 1920 census, this is a group, uh, a boarding house on the outskirts of town, 11 men, the head of the boarding house is a young man, uh, 22 years old. He actually um, arrived in 1914. He was, he's now naturalized as of 1919, um, but he's 22 and the other 10 men living in the boarding house are ranging in age from 31 to 56. Many of them can't read or write or some of them can't even speak English but he's, he's the chief in charge. And what's interesting about the census also is that in the area where they show what your country of birth or your place of birth is, they tried, most of these fellows are listed as Russian, but they tried to uh, pin it down more so that uh, it wasn't just the great hunk of Russia, but something more um, concrete and, and uh, specific. This is the other section of that 1920 census. Um, and we've got three individual Italian families. Um, Edwin Ferbero um, has a wife and two children. Um, he's 40, she's 32. He came to the United States in 1912. He's still an alien, A-L for alien. Yes, he can read and write. Uh, he's from Italy, and I don't know that I ever could figure out exactly um, what part of Italy he came from. He has just two children. Um, his wife came in 1919, so he had been over here basically seven years, uh, probably earning money, sending it back home, getting ready. To, uh, to have his wife and children join him. I'm gonna skip the second family and now move to Louis Sesca. Oh, I wanted to, to mention, Edwin Trebero is a repairman. So he, he is not just a laborer and he probably has a, an income that's slightly higher than that dollar forty a day. Um, than, uh, than the laborers would have. But Louis Sesca um, came in 1915, so did his wife and his children. Um, and then he has a couple of children who were born after they arrived here. 
born in Maryland, so he's probably been living here since 1915. He's got two other people in his household uh, who are listed as boarders. Um, no last name, but it's probably relatives of his since it looks as if they've got the same last name. Um, all Italians. Um, Louis can't read or write. He doesn't, he doesn't speak English either. And so he's a laborer, and this is a pretty typical kind of situation um, with the, uh, the laborers. They really are at the bottom of the barrel, uh, especially when they don't speak any English. And you can imagine in these fights when you've got people yelling at each other in, in different languages, it, it must have been quite a, quite a hoot. I talked a little about the housing situation. These houses, which are along Farquhar Street, they still exist. They show up on the 1904 Sanborn insurance map. So they were probably built uh, by the railroad for its railroad workers. Whether they were occupied by fellows from, uh, families actually from uh, Tidewater, I'm not sure. Um, but this would be really deluxe housing. Um, Tidewater did, as I said, build housing, um, boarding houses and double family dwellings and so forth. Um, but um, these people would have been treated many times a day to trains running right up and down within 10 feet, 10 feet I would say, of their uh, their front doors. The uh, uh, Blue Ridge College was in, ex first it started out with the name Maryland Collegiate Institute. Um, it changed its name around 1911 to Blue Ridge College and by 1912, it had sold out, uh, and I'll mention this later, it had sold out to Tidewater, and Tidewater turned those buildings into offices. They turned them into a hospital, part of it, into a hospital, because as you can well imagine, the kind of work uh, that these men were doing was terribly dangerous. And so a hospital was needed, they had, um, a doctor and a nurse on call, but if there were really serious injuries, those men were placed on the train and sent to hospitals in Baltimore. Also, because so many of these men were coming from Catholic countries, um, I had wondered what was going on in terms of their religious life. Um, and there was a chapel, there had been a chapel on the uh, looks to be the ground floor of the college when it was a uh, Brethren College, and there was still a chapel um, there to serve the families uh, because there was no Catholic church. There were other denominations in Union Bridge, but there was no Catholic church there. So the, the priests would come from Tawny Town, um, from St. Joseph's um, Catholic Church in Tawny Town also from um, St. Peter's in Liberty Town uh, to serve uh, the families. And um, Helen Gorman from the Historical Society remembers going with her father from Tawny Town, uh, taking the priest to, uh, to serve people on Sunday uh, in the little chapel. A couple of pictures here will sort of illustrate some of the situations um, which were just ripe for um, accidents. Um, you can see here a group of men. Uh, there's a, a young fellow here with a bucket to offer water, I guess, to the workers. Um, these are most of them Thomas photos, and, and uh, Mr. Thomas was a, a photographer 
located in Union Bridge, um, shows up in, in 1910, and I don't know how long he was taking photographs. But anyway, constantly laying new track, changing the track, um, down in the quarry with all the loose rock. An early picture showing the little hopper that would be traveling on the track and going up to uh, feed limestone into the uh, top of the, of the furnaces. Doesn't show, but here off to the right would be more of the, uh, the buildings that were being erected. And here in the very background, you can see what would have still been Blue Ridge College or Maryland Collegiate Institute. Um, and right beside it, for those of you who know Union Bridge, was the uh, Mountain View Cemetery. And again, this is uh, one of Thomas's photographs. Here in 1918, um, and this slide is, is pretty hard to see, but they, they pointed out in the newspaper that down here is a locomotive. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a drill or they were very happy when they finally got a steam shovel so that the guys who were hoisting all this rock uh, with shovels and so forth could, uh, could use a steam shovel or whether this thing up here is a steam shovel and this is a drill, I don't know. Maybe some, some of you are more familiar with the uh, equipment in the, uh, in the quarry than I am, but there you've got some of the newer buildings uh, that are part of the Tidewater complex. Um, so this was, this was 1918. And one last place where accidents could happen uh, in a, a power plant like this. Um, don't forget, you, you had men working around furnaces. You had them working in the quarry. You had them setting off dynamite. You had them working here among all this heavy equipment. And also, all of this equipment was coming in on that one railroad track that led up Farquhar Street. Those of you who know me know that I can't do a talk without at least one cemetery stone, one tombstone. So actually we've got three involved in this, this talk. Um, but this is an example of, of someone, uh, one of the, uh, the nasty uh, situations where some of the workers at uh, Tidewater were, were killed. This was a premature explosion um, in the quarry, one of the fellows killed was a 20-year-old fellow named John Ciafani. Um, he had been in this country for at least uh, five years, had been working for Tidewater for four years, came over with his father and another relative. Um, and after he died, he was buried in St. Peter's Cemetery over in um, Liberty Town. Um, the other fellow who was killed was 45 years old. He was a Maryland resident, and um, he left behind a wife and 10 children. It took five months before she got any kind of compensation um, for, the, uh, for the accident that had killed him. So just, just one small example of uh, what was going on in terms of, of dangerous uh, conditions. Okay, so we have had some relatively clean looking pictures of what was going on and here is a nice dirty one. Uh, look at that uh, smoke and um, dust coming out of, and this again is the uh, lime, hydrated lime plant but just belching forth um, all kinds of pollution. Um, this, this was made actually into a postcard uh, that Angelo Monteleone uh, has on his wall at his um, sub and, and pizza shop in, in Union Bridge. Um, so 
So we're talking air pollution, all the health issues, the blast damage that was done to people living in the Union Bridge area. Some of these blasts were, were set off using 6,000 pounds of dynamite and could be felt as far as Westminster. So tremendous damage uh, to homes in the area of uh, Union Bridge. And it depended upon where the wind was blowing as how far the uh, dust was, was going. The fine dust would settle on the roofs and in the gutters. And um, when it rained, of course, it was no longer dust, it was cement. And they talk about some of the windy days, there would be sheets of, uh, of thin cement the size of your palm that were just sort of scattered on the, on the streets. The people couldn't sell their houses because um, nobody wanted to, to buy a house in, in a town under these conditions. And Blue Ridge College um, decided in the spring of, 2000 and, uh, of uh, 1912 that uh, they, they were gonna pull up stakes and they looked at a number of places around to see if, uh, to see where to locate, and they ultimately located, as Shirley indicated, in New Windsor. Um, so here's a little quote. Um, Blue Ridge College was closer, of course, than any other uh, buildings to the plant, and so would have been suffering a lot of the, of the damage from broken windows and so forth. Just as the school was looking forward to a happier day and anticipating a glorious future, a mighty monster came down from the north and settled in a nearby hollow. There within our sight sprang up the Tidewater Portland Cement Company. It seemed to rise to activity in a single day and like a volcano poured forth its death-dealing dust morning, noon, and night. In fact, um, the, the blasting went on seven days a week until they the, the citizens finally were able to get an injunction to have the company stop blasting on Sunday. Well, they could, the people of Union Bridge could endure this kind of pollution and everything just so long. They brought in the uh, State Board of Health to interview people, to t make tests, to see uh, just how bad the situation really was. Um, and the State Board of Health was uh, pretty slow in uh, taking any action. But uh, by 1913, uh, they actually did uh, bring a, uh, uh, a case to court, uh, the State of Maryland versus Tidewater Portland Cement Company. But then the, the cement company itself went into action to try and delay any hearing of the case. The people of Union Bridge knew that they were not the only ones suffering. There were plenty of people living near cement plants all over the United States and everybody was suffering the same sort of situation. They knew they needed to have some kind of a dust collection device uh, on the tops of these uh, furnaces and so forth. So by October of 1914, they finally had a demonstration of a really workable dust collector. Uh, it was done at Union Bridge. It was put on just one furnace. And in doing the testing, between eight and 10 tons of dust were collected from just one furnace in 24 hours. So just one furnace, 24 hours, eight to 10 tons. On some days, it could collect more. Um, so this was obviously part of the solution to the problem. By late 1914, the dust case, as it was called, did go to trial and the cement company admitted its guilt, um, so there was nothing um, to do about that. 
but the state really wanted to have them um, ameliorate or the, the whole situation. But the company said, if we abate all of this, it's gonna put us out of business. And of course the town said, well, we don't wanna lose all those jobs. So it was a balancing situation, a balance that the state of Maryland won, but at a heavy price when you see that the fines for the company were $50 and costs. $50 and costs. But at this, the uh, Tidewater had admitted that it was guilty. And what they could do, individuals could sue the company now because it had, had admitted that it was guilty. And the, com and the uh, judge said that if you don't continue to ameliorate some of these conditions, you're gonna go be seen in court again in May. So things did begin to get better. It was, it was um, a time from 1915 until 1920 when there were raises, more raises given to the workers, uh, Christmas bonuses were given, um, and uh, just uh, there was less contention. You can see it in the newspapers. The, the town knew that it did have tide water over a barrel to some extent because they had to continue to try to put these pollution control um, this pollution control equipment into place. At the same time, of course, the company was expanding, expanding, expanding. So as, as they were cleaning up the air, they were producing more pollution and so forth. Um, as far as Tidewater's role in the First World War, of course, a lot of the men went off to fight and that left um, a, a real shortage of workers. Well, they, they brought in um, 50 women from Baltimore, who they called the khaki girls, who were supposed to do light work. Um, but I really wonder what light work meant because one of those bags of cement weighed 95 pounds. And uh, uh, so what did you have? Three women picking up a bag of cement? I don't know. Um, this was also a period when there were lots of strikes, um, not necessarily right here in Carroll County, but there were general strikes on railroads, um, strikes by coal miners, and of course all of these would have affected um, the whole operation of Tidewater. They needed coal constantly. They needed to get rid of all the cement that they were making. And so if they couldn't uh, send out the cement by train or get in the coal by train, they had to have other main means of, of moving this stuff around. There were times when there were 30 to 50 trucks a day moving cement out of Union Bridge and that was over dirt roads. So I put here cleaner environment. Yes, you no longer had coal dust, but you may have had um, another kind of dust coming off the roads with, with 30 to 50 uh, trucks a day. Some of you may have seen the, the big trucks that are, are uh, taking cement out of Union Bridge today. Um, I don't know what you call them. Uh, with uh, those huge those huge trucks going down the road between Union Bridge through Johnsville and, and down to Route 26 and, and so forth. It's just another way, even today, of, of moving, besides uh, moving cement out on the, the railroad, they're moving it still by truck. But at least the roads are all paved today. In this whole period from 1910 to 1920, there were, of course, increased usage of, of concrete. Um, the dust collectors were getting more sophisticated 
and you had unionization of the cement workers, and today um, Lehigh is a, a union shop, right, Cornell? It's a union shop? By 1920, you can see in the newspaper uh, a, a real change. This plant superintendent, Guy LaForge, was there. He started out work as the chief chemist in 1913. He retired in 1946, so he was there probably as superintendent about 30 years. Um, the, uh, the newspaper, the Union Bridge Pilot, began uh, carrying a column just for the workers at Tidewater. Um, and these appear weekly uh, because the Union Bridge Pilot was a weekly newspaper. The company was putting aside an area for the workers to have gardens and they were also offering prizes. Um, the first prize and the third prize in 1920 were won by foreign workers. Um, $15, $10, and $5 were the, uh, the awards, but in those days, of course, that was pretty decent money. And by 1920, um, the, the census showed that now Union Bridge, with all these workers, um, was the second largest town in Carroll County. The, the newspaper also had frequent uh, advertisements for Tidewater, and there you see up at the top their safety slogans, carefree is careful, not careless. Uh, between 1914 and 1920, 26 million bags of cement. Uh, at 95 pounds each. Uh, and here is Guy LaForge as the general superintendent. Um, another, another tombstone. Um, the story behind this tombstone is, it gives you a little picture of, of the, uh, the lives of some of these immigrant workers. Uh, Domenico Fabrizi was found dead, having been run over by the Western Maryland train uh, between Union Bridge and, and Linwood. Um, it looked like it was a case where he had just fallen in front of the train. But his boots were carefully put off to the side which um, made people a little suspicious that this was not just um, an accident. Um, what really ha had happened was that Domenico and his wife had children and uh, at least one boarder living in their shack and here it is January of uh, 1920 and they, uh, Domenico and his wife were going out early in the morning before daybreak and picking up coal off the tracks to heat their house. Uh, apparently Domenico was an abusive husband and so his wife with pretense of going back to get herself some kind of um, additional clothing picked up a gun, brought it down, shot him, took his boots off. Uh, ultimately she tried to blame it on the border um, but uh, it was ultimately found that she had been the person who was, was guilty um, as I recall, she did not go to jail. Um, I think they, they recognized that this was a, an abusive situation. Um, but just the, how poor they were, that they were picking up coal off the railroad tracks um, on cold mornings in January, gives you some picture of what life was like for just the ordinary laborer. In 1925, Lehigh, which was then the largest cement producing company in the United States, bought out Tidewater and has been the owner under various umbrella um, companies ever since. 
And I was there one day uh, about a year ago, and what was coming out at the top of that tower was just this little wisp of sort of white smoke. It was really lovely. I know there's still plenty of issues um, sometimes with, with Lehigh, but the pollution in, in also mercury pollution, they've been reducing it, reducing it. They now are receiving prizes for how clean an operation it is. And this, they're very proud of this Energy Star um, award. Yes? It, I, don't, I don't know what it was. It, thank you. It, it was water vapor. Um, it, it looked very clean. Um, one, more, one more short story here. Um, with us today, we have John Sipes, and Edward Trite was John Sipes' uncle. John asked me if I would share this story with you. Actually, the story begins back in 1902 when Edward Trite was a 21-year-old fellow and was cleaning out the well of his family that lived in the Linwood Union Bridge area and um, went down in the well, thought everything was going to be okay, but as he stirred up in the bottom of the well, there were um, fumes that were released that were toxic. And he realized he was about to become unconscious, called for the bucket that had lowered him into the well um, to pull him up. But as it was pulling him up, he toppled out of it. There were other people around his two brothers, twin brothers, uh, went down in the bucket, put him in, he was hoisted up, not breathing well at all. But by the time they got the two brothers up, they were both dead. Trite himself um, did recover. He married, had a family, and he went to work for uh, Tidewater. You can see down here. Uh, a very serious accident occurred in February of 1917, and Edward Trite, who had just moved into company housing with his family, his wife was pregnant and he had several children. Um, his hip was crushed between two cars, railroad cars, and he was sent to the hospital in Baltimore. He died in June. His family was evicted from company housing and they had to go back to Western Maryland, his wife and children. But there's a, a very nice ending to this story. Um, John Sipes went to uh, Kent Martin, who is currently the plant manager at uh, Lehigh, and told him the story about Edward Trite, who was buried at Pike Creek Church of the Brethren Cemetery with no tombstone because the family had no money. And so from 1917 until 2014, his grave was unmarked. And Kent Martin said, Lehigh will take care of it. And so Lehigh paid for this tombstone, the engraving of it, and John Sipes um, was able to, to get this nice tombstone put up in Pipe Creek Church of the Brethren for his um, uncle who died so many years ago. So that's the kind of nice thing um, Lehigh is, has done. It's also done some very nice things for the Historical Society of Carroll County. So, that's the end. Um, if, if you have any questions, uh, I'll try to answer them. I'm certainly not any kind of an expert on uh, the making of cement. Um, yeah. Uh, one way back when this was really a mess, uh, where did the management live? 
the question was where did where did the plant supervisor live? I don't know. I don't know, Bill. Um, it, it certainly is better control. When I came here in 1969, I remember there was a gray pole all over Union Bridge. And um, if you go into the uh, Met, uh, Mountain View Cemetery, you can see on the stones there this very thin layer of cement still. But um, it's uh, Lehigh has cut down more and more and more on the, uh, the pollution uh, of every kind. Um, so uh, it, it's, just, it's been a gradual process. But yes, I'm sure you're, you're right, Bill, that depending upon which way the, the wind was blowing, you got um, cement dust and dirt and everything else all in a, in a big circle, probably, around the town. Yes? Uh, the story I told uh, begins just about the time the American film industry was growing. Was there a movie theater by World War I for the people in town? The there was. There, there was a, a, a movie theater. I can't remember what it was called. But yes, I had seen advertisements for, for a movie theater there. One of the things to, to remember, I think, about this whole situation is that Union Bridge, a very small town, but very typical of what was happening in Pittsburgh, Birmingham, Butte, Montana, all of these were towns or cities that were dominated by a big, heavy industry that was wreaking havoc on the environment. And now, we know that Pittsburgh has cleaned up its act, and I understand there's still some very ugly scars in Butte, Montana, but I, I think Anaconda Copper and some of those other companies. Uh, Birmingham, I can't speak for Birmingham. I've never been there. Um, maybe some of you have. Any other questions? Bill. The, the original building that you used to process It is. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Just storage. Okay. Yes. Does anyone know the route that the Western Maryland took to get here? Now, for instance, there's a number of tracks still there, and the Western Maryland runs through uh, Westminster sometimes, or runs through Reisterstown. Was, was that the route it took to get here? Went through Reisterstown, and it goes up? Yeah. And I'm just curious of how it actually, and how long did it take to figure uh, the There were a lot of train service back in those days, but I don't know how speedy it was. Yes, well, uh, they were bringing workers up uh, because of the housing situation. Um, there were people who were commuting daily uh, from Westminster on the train. Um, but yes, it, it was that route, and it eventually ended up right down on the... Uh, Docks in uh, in Baltimore, right, Dave? Um, so we we do have a uh, some of this material, a lot of it, actually, in the Carroll History Journal, which uh, the Historical Society published last year. Um, we do have some copies. Oh, wonderful copies. Okay, thank you very much for coming. And let me thank you all for coming. It's great to have you all here. Be sure to come next uh, month, at December the 11th, when we'll have a talk about a very interesting topic, if you like CSI on TV, and that is strange and unusual crimes that have occurred in Carroll County over the years.
Our own Kathy Beatty will be your presenter, and I know that that will interest a lot of you. Um, hopefully, uh, CMC will be back with us. Uh, they're fil here filming today, which is ni always nice to see them. And uh, they're, and speaking of the devil, they're having their ball awards, their, their, uh, their video awards coming up here in another couple Saturdays. Uh, very nice uh, occasion. Uh, we look forward to seeing those of you who are enrolled to come on Friday night for our 75th anniversary gala at Antrim 1844, cocktails at 530. Uh, we do have, again, our wonderful treasure chest, courtesy of Art Palaya back there. I encourage you, as you filter out today, to take a look at that and buy some tickets. You don't have to be present at the fair on Friday night to win, and it's, uh, I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. Uh, we're counting on your participation. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next month. Thank you.